Number 10, Richard Cabell. This man lived in Devon, England during the 1600s and was apparently a huge dirtbag. He would torment people in this town and even abuse his wife. One night, in a violent rage, he struck his wife and she tried to escape. He then hunted her down. People believe that he felt he had the freedom to treat everyone horribly because he made a deal with the devil for immortality. But he did eventually die on July 5th, 1677. After he died, there were reports of a ghostly figure walking around the gravesite. This freaked out the locals so much, so they put a giant slab of stone on top of his grave as well as encased the tomb with metal bars. And it was said that at night you could see a ghostly figure that kind of looked like a beast with glowing red eyes. Some people thought that it was Satan looking for the soul that belonged to him. Number 9, The Carpenter. The devil's weaved into history in so many different places. This ancient tale comes from a village called Tyrol in Austria. The legend has it that the locals had a well-traveled bridge that they used to cross from their village to a village called Schruns. One day, the bridge was destroyed in a massive flood. The villagers were very distressed, so they got help from a local carpenter. They told him that if he could rebuild the bridge in three days, they would pay him a huge amount of money. He knew such a task would be impossible, so he asked the villagers if he could have a day to think about it in order to come up with a solution. That night, when he was trying to find a way to build the bridge in such a short period of time, he was visited by a man with a little green hat. I love how these stories just have some creepy dude that shows up to your house in the middle of the night, and you're like, ah, I wonder what he wants. Couldn't be anything bad. Well, the little man told the carpenter that he would build the bridge for him, and he could keep all the money. The only thing he wanted in return was the soul from the first person to leave this house and cross the bridge. The carpenter knew this was the devil. Devil, so he had a plan. The next day the bridge was built and the carpenter showed up. The devil saw him there and was jumping in excitement to get his prize. Then the carpenter pushed a goat onto the bridge and said here's your soul. You got played dude. Legend says the devil took the goat and people started roasting him as he was walking around with the goat. People were like, hey, you should have read the fine print. Oh, you two look like a great couple. I just love the idea of people roasting the devil. Like, oh, prince of darkness can't trick a tradesman. <laughs> Number eight, George Lukens. Back in the day, if you got sick, you kind of had two options. You either got sicker and died, or you could go to a church and get an exorcism. On May 31st, 78, George Lukens wasn't feeling too hot. He had started having convulsions and it was reported that he would yell in a voice that didn't sound human. So he went to the doctor, but after trying almost everything, the doctors couldn't cure him of whatever his ailment was. So he had plan B. He went to see Reverend Easterbrook to get his soul washed. The Reverend tried to help George, but it seemed that what was tormenting him was too strong for just him. So he brought in six other priests to perform a super exorcism. The seven of them took their combined power to cleanse George. During the process, he changed through seven different demonic personalities, one of which claimed to be the devil. After the super exorcism, George was cured. And probably didn't live past 35, because that's how life went back then. Number seven, the Codex Gigas. Would you read a book that might have been written by the devil? I think that one's a hard pass for me. I'll stick to reading the back of cereal boxes. Well, the Codex Gigas is said to have the devil's actual handwriting, and whoever reads it becomes cursed. Why would you read that? I don't know if I believe that the devil's handwriting is in the book, but I wouldn't want to be wrong just for some light reading. The story goes that back in 1523, Ludovico Spoletano wanted to make the best spaghetti ever, so he summoned the devil. Nah, I'm just kidding. He wanted to answer a series of questions he had been asked. Exam season is very tough. It's documented that the devil possessed him, grabbed a pen, and started writing. Most of the text has never been decoded except for one sentence that says, I think it smells like updog. Number six, through the window. This one was written by Redditor Gareca. It's a story his father told him about when his dad was growing up. He said that when his dad and uncle were younger, his uncle was a bit of a rebellious kid. Never listen, would stay up late, draw dicks on everything. His father told him that it was a big problem, that his uncle was constantly challenging authority and would get in fights with his parents all the time. Well, one night, the whole family heard a blood-curdling scream come from his uncle's room. The family rushed in there and his uncle was freaking out. He said there was a man standing outside his window. Their father went to check for someone but couldn't find anything. His uncle describes the man as wearing a long trench coat and having no face except for glowing red eyes. After this, his uncle was as sweet as pie, became a respectful member of society. So was this a devil encounter? Or was this a story a father told his son so he wouldn't act up. That's healthy parenting. Scare him psychologically, but he'll be a good kid. Number five, Michael Scott. No, God! 
Not the hilarious character from The Office. Michael Scott was a Scottish mathematician born in 1175 and is considered one of the most brilliant men to come out of Scotland. He travelled through Europe and eventually ended up in Italy. While in Italy, his brilliance didn't go unnoticed. He gained the attention of Emperor Frederick II. Frederick brought Michael into his court as the head astrologer. But when you're a super smart guy back then, people get a little suspicious. It's said he could summon demons to do his bidding and they would go all over the world to bring him delicacies. And that's just where his power started. There's myths of him defeating a covet of witches that he turned into stone. It's even said he changed the course of the river steeds. But the most famous one is him summoning the devil to build a road to his castle. His father had just built a shiny new castle and it needed a road. I mean, you don't want to be the only castle in the neighborhood without a road. Like, what do people think? So he called the devil and many demons to build a road for him. He could have just hired contractors. He owed the devil his soul and foresaw that the devil would kill him by dropping a rock on his head. So he always wore a metal cap. But one day, he took off his metal cap when entering a church, and a rock fell on his head and killed him. They get you when you least expect. Number 4. John D. John Dee was born in 1527 on July 13th. He was an Elizabethan mathematician and astrologer, but he also liked to dabble in the occult. He was into some pretty freaky stuff. Even though he was researching black magic behind closed doors, he managed to work his way up as a man of intellect, becoming the royal astrologer for Queen Mary. However, his little secrets caught up with him and he was arrested for heresy in 1555. How do you get caught for something back then? The only way you would find out would be if you told people. Like, how was your weekend? Ah, pretty good, you know, sacrificed a goat to the Dark Lord. Anyways, when he got out, he kept digging into the occult. In 1582, he claimed to contact the spirit world. People weren't a fan of this so he had to move up north to the Manchester Collegiate Church. You can go visit his office to this day. There's the desk that he worked at with a giant burn mark in it. It's said that it's the devil's footprint. I would be pissed. I work all this time to summon the devil. He shows up and he puts his feet on my furniture. Number 3. Robert Johnson Become one of the greatest musicians who ever lived and people are going to start rumors about you. Robert Johnson is one of the most talented and influential blues musicians who has ever walked the earth. And a big myth about him is that he sold his soul to the devil to become as great as he did. As the story goes, he was walking down a highway and came across a man that offered him the ability to play the blues like no one has ever done before but it would cost him his soul. Robert was like, yeah I'll do that. I mean, what is a soul really? It's like a concept or like whatever. Well, Robert went down in history for his amazing skills and died suspiciously at 27. Number two, Niccolo Paganini said to be the greatest violinist who ever lived. Seemed to be a common theme that back in the day if you were great at something, they probably thought you sold your soul to the devil. No, it can be that you have like a natural gift and you work super hard, you just made a deal. Well the same speculation goes for Niccolo. He was an Italian violinist like none other. He was so gifted that he would surpass anyone who ever taught him. He was touring at 15 and probably got hit on a lot. Part of why people probably thought that he had sold his soul to the devil was that he looked so ghoulish. He was tall, skinny, had pale skin, long black hair. He was kind of like a hot Edward Scissorhands. People would even say that they could see the devil hold his violin while he played. I think they were just jealous. Number one, George Whitefield. Now this one is my favorite for sure. George was a traveling evangelist. He wandered around trying to get people hyped on God. I mean, we've all seen these guys. Do it, Jesus! A brand new hip, bam, 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 bam. In 1740, George was in Ipswich, Massachusetts. He was putting on a banger show. Like people were going nuts. Apparently, the sermon was so hot and he was bashing the devil so hard that the devil showed up and was like, you talking And George was like, yeah, I'm talking And then he fought the devil. This is like an episode of Maury. George then summoned the holy power to push the devil out and after that the devil fell off a cliff and landed on one foot. He's got like a plus 10 on acrobatics. It's said that the devil's footprint is there to this day. The devil is probably at home like, dude, I don't even know you. Why are you talking so much smack? Starting us off with number 10 is The Hand. This one's from Steven Wagner who said his dad told him the story. So back in 1942 in Juarez, Mexico, his dad was around 20 years old and he went to a circus that was visiting town. His younger brother came along and they didn't really go to see the acts, they were more interested in the freak shows. Disappointed after seeing the performers, they were about to leave with two girls when they ran into a short stubby man. The stranger introduced himself 
himself as the greatest illusionist in the world. That's quite a hefty title. When asked if he was part of the circus, the man said the owner turned him down because his act was so frightening, the owner said he was Satan himself. Once he had their attention, he invited them back to his trailer in order to show them the act. Once inside, the stranger put a glove on his right hand, started running his left hand over his right while wiggling his fingers. He then started chanting bizarre words and when he took the glove off, everyone's jaws just dropped. The stranger's hand was completely skeletal. He turned it, let them see the back, it was completely real. His brother went to take a closer look and the man grabbed his head and said he was really about to show them something now and at this point, everybody shat themselves and made a run for it. The stranger came out onto his porch laughing and on the floor nearby was a bed of long nails pointing up which he jumped onto. Weird flex but okay. Blood started coming out of his feet but he was still just laughing it off and from that day onwards Steven's father and brother knew they had met Satan. Coming in at number 9 is Father Yurban Grandee. Now Father Yurban was a Roman Catholic priest that lived in the Le Dame part of France. He was under major scrutiny and received a lot of criticism for ignoring his celibacy vow. If anything he was known for having sexual relations with many women and as someone who had an elevated sense of a lustful depravity. By 1632 he was accused of sending the demon Asmodai to enchant a group of Ursula nuns into committing evil acts and becoming his sex slaves. You know, as priests do. After numerous nuns made accusations of seduction against him, he was arrested, then acquitted, and then re-arrested. During his second arrest, he was tortured by judges, after which they revealed a contract they found in his bedroom, which indicated he had signed a deal with Satan and many other demons. They saw it as evidence of him making a diabolical pact and convicted him of witchcraft and sentenced him to death. He was burnt at the stake. At number eight, we have a better life. This one's from Redditor Kodas underscore gaming, who said he had a really rough upbringing. His father abandoned his family, and his mother was a addict. CPS ended up taking him and his brother away but a few years later his mum was clean and back with their dad and they regained custody. Sort of happy ending kind of but not really. They lived in a small house in central Texas and according to the user the house had a terrifying aura. Anytime he was home he felt like he was being watched especially in the bathroom and he would have regular nightmares. And at this point in his life his mum was working herself to death because their dad was a lazy slob who did nothing. She got so depressed she tried to take her own life and desperate to help, the user started praying to God every single day. But nothing changed. He realized for something to change, perhaps he could call on the demonic entity that engulfed his house rather than God. He researched satanic rituals for ages and finally found the one he needed. While his family were out for ice cream one day, he got on his knees, wax coming down the candles he'd lit, and cut his hand and started drawing symbols on the ground in his blood. Obviously, while crying the whole time, because who wouldn't cry after? After doing that. He recited the words and made the deal. And right after he did that, a cold breeze swept through the house and everything went black. But he was pretty much unfazed because he expected something like that to happen, so he went to bed that night and had the worst nightmare ever. He saw himself in the reflection of the mirror in the bathroom with corpse grey skin, bloody tears, and his eyes were crimson as well. During the dream, he thought, This can't be me, and then the reflection started laughing, saying, It is now, you made the deal. He woke up in the bathtub covered in scratches and scars and it just kept happening and getting worse. One month later he started seeing things, hearing things, his nail beds began to recede and bleed, his canines became sharper and his tongue used to get cut out of nowhere and he started full on hallucinating and having visions of the past. Other than his mum getting a high paying job, not much at all. So moral of the story, know what you're going into before you ask the devil for help. Filling our number 7 slot is Joseph Smith. Now, Joseph Joseph was a Mormon prophet in the early 1800s who claimed he encountered Satan before he saw Christ for the first time. We have both big shots in one story, how about that? The story goes that despite never doing this before, one day he just decided he was going to pray to God out loud. He went into the woods on a sunny day and knelt down and began to pray. I don't know why he went into the woods, he could have just done it in his house, but okay. But as soon as he did, he said he felt he was seized by a power that engulfed him entirely. He said it was so powerful 
powerful he tried to speak but felt like his tongue was bound. A thick darkness surrounded him and he thought for sure he was going to die. And I mean fair enough for being realistic, if I felt that I'd probably think I was going to die too. He was ready to sink into this despair that was around him but in one final hope he used all his strength to call on God to get him out of Satan's hold. Then all of a sudden he saw a huge pillar of light over his head which came down on him. As the light rested on him he saw two personages in the air above him and everything was fine again. At least this one had a happy ending sort of. Now at number 6 is Madame Lalaurie. Delphine Lalaurie has been mentioned many times on this channel but just a quick recap for you, she was a big creole socialite in New Orleans. To the public, that is. Inside her house, she tortured and killed the majority of her slaves in a way you can't even imagine. In 1834, a house fire took over her mansion, and that's when she got exposed. Anyway, with some stroke of luck, she managed to escape New Orleans and go to France, but many believe she didn't just escape due to luck. She invented a religion involving voodoo and black magic, and on top of that, people vehemently believe she made a pact with the devil in order to be able to still be wealthy, still be free, and escape whilst committing these horrendous acts. I mean for me it was either the devil pact or she paid a lot of important money to let her go. What do you guys think? Coming in at number 5 is the satanic cult. This one's from Brad who said back in 2005, him and his friends spent one summer TPing a lot of houses. In the town they grew up, there were always rumours of a satanic cult that operated around a 10 minute drive away. So one day, they decided to go check it out and TP it. Ballsy move I have to say. The five friends went there the day before moon, which I guess is a part of every scary story you hear nowadays, and they bypassed the fence and ended up in a garden enclosure and heard an eerie high pitched sound. Ignoring it they continued to explore, found an old locked church and found nothing else and decided to leave. Bit anticlimactic but just stay with me. When they got to their car their key which was working perfectly 10 minutes prior just stopped working. The car alarm started going off and then it magically just unlocked by itself. They piled in and drove off and mid drive the lights in the car just went off. The driver didn't press anything to cause it, it just happened. Panicked they rushed home and when Brad got to his front porch, he found three identical black cats. Keep in mind he lives a good 25 miles away from the cult so how do these cats even get to his house? He took the cats as a bad omen and decided to take the cats a few miles out of town and leave them there. And the whole drive he was being followed by two black cars despite taking small dirt roads. Now I don't know if people were just messing with him here or the satanic cult was there and they saw him and everything was there doing, but either way. It's scary and it's creepy. At number four is Giuseppe Tartini. Now, from the name, doesn't he just sound like a brilliant Italian musician of some kind? His name just has the ring to it, you know? Anyway, Tartini was an Italian composer and violinist during the Baroque period. He was very influential in Italy, but he was also known for his huge inferiority complex and uncontrollable temper. And I can just see that equaling to a lot of smashed violins. But anyway, the story goes that one day Tartini heard Francesco Veracci playing the violin better than him and he was fuming and also dissatisfied with his own skills. The event made him spiral into depression for months and in that time he worked in solitude and practiced the violin for 12 hours a day. During this period it said he had a dream in which the devil appeared and he met him. He appeared at the foot of his bed and played a sonata on the violin like he invented the damn activity. He offered him success in all his musical dreams in exchange for his soul. Did he accept? Well, it was was never really confirmed, but when he woke up the next day he wrote down as much of the sonata as he could, but no matter how many times he played it, it just wasn't as good as the devil's version. If you want to check it out, the sonata in question is called the devil's trill sonata, his most well known piece, and it's quite hard to play even by today's standards. But the fact he could never play it as well as the devil, I mean doesn't that just indicate he wasn't successful in everything he wanted to be? So am I the only one identifying this major plot hole we have going on? Did he accept? Did he not? Let me know Tartini. Filling our number 3 slot is Gemma Galgani. Gemma was an Italian mystic, later saint in Italy during the late 19th century. She believed that the devil was waging a personal war against her. She said he loved giving her horrible headaches to the point she couldn't even pray. I mean honestly I just feel like that was a bad migraine but moving on. She went on to say that once she was writing at her desk alone and the devil came and dragged her from the table by her hair with such force that her hair came out in clumps. In another attack the devil took the form 
of a big black dog and put his paws on her shoulders making her whole body ache all over. In another one she was drinking holy water and he twisted her arms so backwards that she fell to the ground in pain. If that's not bad enough she said he even took on the form of people she trusted or knew and once he even took the form of an angel. He kept trying to get her to give in to the wickedness and she kept resisting and she passed out. Just imagine all this happening in your room and no one's there to help you, I'd be terrified. But I'm also curious as to what form the devil took when he attacked her all those times and if anybody was around were they seeing this happen, was she being attacked by an invisible force, like what was happening here? Now at number 2 is Steve, this one's from Reddit to Shabby Boa whose real name is Steve and who used to be a trucker for 30 years. One night after a drop off he was on his way back home when he stopped at a diner to pee. It was completely empty, no customers, no staff, absolutely no one. He quickly peed and when he came out a grey haired man was sitting at the bar. He told Steve he owned the diner and gave him food and a drink. When he got up to leave the man said food is not what you truly desired tonight. Waited out Steve left and got into his truck. About an hour and a half later he had to pee again, Steve you've got a small bladder mate, and saw another small diner which he stopped at. He went inside and again it was completely empty save a grey haired man at the bar. It was the same man who said nice to have you back Steve as soon as he walked in. Steve got pissed at this point thinking he was being screwed over by this guy and demanded to know what the guy wanted. He said he was trying to help Steve. He started asking about Steve and how he used to have a family. Steve told him his wife and daughter died in a house fire years ago caused by faulty wiring. But the man questioned him saying it wasn't just faulty wiring. The faulty wiring was a happy coincidence that just so happened to have happened the same time Steve left a lit cigarette in the house. Steve fought with him more and in the end the man offered him a deal. He said he could bring back his wife and daughter in exchange for his soul after he died. Thinking it was complete bullshit. He agreed and left the diner. Before he did, he asked the man who he was, to which he responded, I am the devil. That night, he got home as if he never stopped anywhere at all, and when he entered the house, he heard his wife say, Steve, is that you? and the small footsteps of his daughter. He was so excited, but when they came down the stairs, their skin was charred black. Chunks of it were falling off, their clothes had fused and melted with their skin, and Steve could barely hold in his puke. And at that point, he'd realized he'd made the biggest mistake mistake ever and that the next 30 years were literally gonna be hell. And finally at number 1 is the man. This one's from VR Greg who said she met the devil for the first time when she was 8 years old. She was walking through a forest on her way home from school when she encountered a black haired man in a shabby suit. Except one foot of his was a goat hoof and the other was a rooster claw. She could see them when she looked at him directly but peripherally they looked completely normal. She took him for a walk and then he left. By the time she was a teenager she assumed the counter was maybe a dream or maybe that she just imagined the whole thing. But one day she was watching a news story about a man who got away with killing his wife and as they showed the judge announcing the not guilty verdict the murderer turned around and smiled at a man behind him who wasn't his lawyer. She recognized him right Right away, black hair, shabby suit, hadn't aged a day. Her parents threw her a surprise 16th birthday to which nobody came to, which is just really sad, I'm sorry that happened to you. She ran home crying and she knew no one came because her classmate Erin had her party the same day just to spite her. That night she slept thinking about all the horrible ways Erin deserved to be punished and the next day at the breakfast table her dad looked shaken. He told her that Erin had been found dead in the park. She met the devil the same day in her room and he told that she had wanted it to happen and he executed it for her. He offered her a deal but thankfully the one piece of common sense that 90% of people possess is knowing that you should never make a deal with the devil so she didn't. The girl didn't see him again until the funeral of her mother where he told her the doctors lied to her about her mother dying peacefully, that it was agony and that no one was around to help her. She started immediately screaming and her dad ran over to her and made her sit down. When she asked him where the black haired man was he said he was standing alone honey and just started screaming out of nowhere. Shivers. That gave me shivers. Starting us off with number 10 is Padre Pio. Saint Pio of Pietrelcina was an Italian saint who had countless violent battles with the devil, many of which left him physically wounded and bleeding. One night in 1906, he had footsteps coming towards his room, so he thought it was one of his friends, so he called out to them, but soon realized no sound was coming out of his mouth. No matter what he did, he just couldn't speak. He then saw a huge menacing black hound with smoke coming out of his mouth on a window ledge nearby. 
The dog then came into his room and said, Him it is, it is him. Is this a Yoda? Is it a hound? Who knows? And then the dog disappeared. Other encounters involved him being dragged from his bed, being thrown around his room, being spat on. One time he was even left with three broken ribs. And Satan would come back to him in different forms as a black cat, as young provocative girls trying to test his chastity, as his own superiors, or worst of all, in sacred forms. Now, what made him such a huge target for Satan was his work as an exorcist. It was said the second possessed people saw him, they would go ballistic, cursing him doing God knows what and just before leaving their body Satan would say Father Pio do not steal the bodies from us and we will not bother you. Another attack in 1964 left him with a critically injured spine and various cuts. Moral of the story, Padre Pio was a badass for surviving all of that. Coming in at number 9 is The Corner. This one's from Amy Strata. She was in her bed asleep and mind you her bedroom is just a simple square and there's a door sized space between the wall and the foot of her bed. That night she woke up at a exactly 2am and the only light in the room was coming from her alarm clock. She was just casually looking up the ceiling but something was looking back at her. It moved to the corner of her room and it had four legs that were bent backwards towards the corner of the room whilst its torso was still facing her. Its legs had gripped the ceiling and the two walls of the corner and my mind is breaking even trying to imagine what angle this thing was in and Amy couldn't see its face, just the shape of its head and its hollow eyes that were just staring at her. Her. She knew she couldn't run because it was clearly blocking the door, so she got under the covers and didn't come out till the morning. I mean, I still use that tactic now when I think someone's in the house, and clearly it worked for her. The first time she mentioned the incident to anybody was two years after it happened, and her mum said that her stepdad had seen the exact same figure in his tour of Iraq. He had gone into a forest despite warnings from locals not to. Inside, he had to perform a collective exorcism on his fellow comrade who became possessed. The stepdad believed Satan came out of the soul and started following him around. So when he came home, it was only about time before his stepdaughter Amy encountered him too. At number 8 we have the drummer. This one's from Reddit user Smoking Finger Guns, ha ha ha, whose grandpa told him the story. Whilst on a road trip with his granddad, he started recording a story from his youth. His granddad was divorced, but when he was younger, he tried to start a band with his brother-in-law Keith. Keith was a great guitarist and the grandpa was a decent bassist. So they bought a small bit of land in rural California that had a house and a barn and turned the barn into a recording studio. They started hanging listings advertising the position of an experienced drummer and after many many trials they settled on a man named Dave. One night they were all drinking and celebrating in the barn, Keith at this point had passed out, jog on Keith, and Dave and the grandpa started talking about weird stuff, mostly occult. Dave's expression then changed drastically and he told the grandpa he was a satanist and one of really high standing. Did that not come up during the drumming trial with Dave? Like, I feel like that should have come up. But anyway, the grandpa didn't believe Dave and asked him to prove it. Big mistake. But anyway, Dave gets up in all seriousness, holds out his arms and starts chanting in Latin like it's his first language. A few minutes later, Keith, who has passed out, stands fully erect and his eyes are white. No pupil, no iris, just white. Very freaked out, the grandpa instinctively said Jesus Christ, after which point Dave projectile vomits and then dry heaves and then looks at the grandpa with eyes that could kill. He let out a sort of dog growl of some kind and said never speak that name again in my presence, after which both Dave and Keith collapsed. While both were passed out, the grandpa went to the corner of the room just watching them and he felt a hot sensation on his shoulder like someone or some entity was grabbing him. At that point, he really wasn't sure if it was Satan himself or on the opposite side his guardian angel. Filling out number 7 slot is the horseshoe. So this one involves St Dunstan who was an English clergyman in the 10th century and who also claimed they had had many encounters with Satan. St Dunstan was a very respected man, he was pious, he was intelligent, a musician, a skilled metalsmith and an artist too. The whole package pretty much. Whilst living in Glastonbury one day a man approached him asking him to make a metal chalice for him and Dunstan agreed and got to work but as soon as he did he realized the man or the thing in front of him was shape-shifting before his eyes. He went from a man to a woman and then to a child and the transformations were
was so seamless, it was incredibly hard to believe. Okay, the man is shape shifting. They could be the roughest transformations ever, and it'd still be hard to believe. But anyway, Dunson realized very quickly that this was the devil and pretended not to notice the whole shape shifting thing. When he got the chance, he grabbed a pair of red hot tongs and pierced the man in the nostrils, which caused the man immense pain and cast the devil out. His second encounter happened while he was playing the harp. A smiley vagrant approached him this time, but St. Dunstan somehow knew it was Satan again, and he grabbed him by the leg and tried shooing him like you shoe a horse. Satan screamed at a pitch so high St. Dunstan thought he was going to pass out, but he persevered. He let Satan go on the condition that he never enter or approach a house that had a horseshoe hanging outside its doorway, and thus the whole legend of horseshoes being lucky was born. Now at number 6 is The Ritual. This one's from Reddit at Graveyard Song 11 and when she was around 15 she met her friend's half brother Luke and they became partners in crime. He was a typical goth white makeup, red and black eyeshadow and those two colours were pretty much the only ones he wore in terms of clothes as well. One Friday night they were bored as hell and Luke suggested summoning Satan because what else are we to do when we're bored? Board games? Screw that! Satan it is. Either way Luke lived opposite a cemetery so they stopped at his house for supplies mainly candles, milk, a bowl, salt and string. They got to the cemetery and found a clearing and gathered some twigs. Luke grabbed a stick and started drawing a weird symbol. She described it as an upside down triangle with a V under it and an X through it. He then made a circle of salt around it and put the candles around it as well. They stood inside the circle and he began talking starting with O oh, Lucifer. He kept muttering unintelligibly and dropped all of their ingredients into the bowl of milk. He then took her hand and cut it so it bleed a bit and then he cut into his own arm even deeper but directed both blood sources into the bowl. He kept chanting and at this point the user was freaking out saying you know I believe you, you can summon satan, just stop now. Luke ignored her and started speaking in a language that wasn't latin, it was just unrecognizable. He got up the bowl and then started vomiting violently. He got onto his hands and knees heaving and then asked what just happened. She said she thinks they did the ritual wrong but Luke insisted they didn't. Things got pretty weird after that and they kind of stopped being friends which I'm really not surprised about. But every time she ran into Luke he just looked like death and her own cut wasn't healing at all and at points it would bleed like it was just freshly done. A month later she ran into him again and he smelled like rotting and alcohol. He apologized for what he had done to her and gave her a necklace for protection. She asked him whether he needed protection too and he said he had done the ritual too many times that the necklace didn't work for him anymore. Nowadays she stopped wearing the necklace and her scar started bothering her again. And mind you, it's been years. It became tender and red and throbbed like it was freshly inflicted. And on top of that, the necklace encounter was the last time she ever saw Luke. He disappeared off the planet, no Facebook, no Google searches, his own mother didn't even know where he went. Safe to say Luke's continuous summonings and encounters with Satan didn't leave him in anyone's good books. Coming in at number 5 is the Boar of Fire. So back in 1683 in Poundsgate, England, a strange figure came into the Tavistock Inn and he was dressed in all black and wearing a cloak, but the weird thing was he had cloven hooves instead of feet. Which is actually a recurring theme. If you watch part 2, you'll see that in some of those stories as well he appeared with hooves as feet as well. So hooves. Satan, it's a thing. But anyway, he asked the staff for directions to why he'd come in the moor in Dartmouth. The staff were terrified of this man who wasn't really a man but looked evil as hell, pun intended, and gave him the directions. A few days after this visit, a huge ball of fire smashed into the church of St. Pancras, which was barely a stone's throw away from the inn. It bounced about wildly whilst killing a bunch of people and a dog. Deniers blamed it on an errant ball of lightning, which, by the way, I don't even think is possible, correct me if I'm wrong. But the innkeepers and those around them vehemently held the belief that it was the power of Satan. At number 4 is Satan's Fun House. This one's from Reddit user Demonic Wolf, and the story happened to him when he was 15 last June. Since his father was a computer programmer, he became very good at it as well, and hacking into the deep web was quite easy for him. One day he got onto a website called Satan's Fun House, and like anyone on the deep web, he just assumed it was just some kind of mess up porn, but before he could click off it, he got a message from a chat room he was on in another 
tab. The person told him to go to the site and that he wouldn't want to miss today's show. He asked the other person what show and the person replied also taking his username which was weird because he had hidden his IP address so the other person shouldn't have been able to see his username which was demonic. The other person continued saying go to Satan's fun house and find out. The boy was scared at this point because the guy knew his name and the fact he was on the Satan fun house site. He felt like he was being watched and I don't blame him. He went into the link but it just said error 404. He went back to the chat saying the link didn't work but the person told him he was in the right place don't worry. Suddenly a loud deep raspy voice flooded his headphones and he was directed to another site where he saw a video. He didn't describe the video but said the extent of mutilation he saw wasn't even the main part. He saw things that couldn't even be explained, no lighting trick, no camera trick, nothing. He was certain it was Satan at work himself. He shut the screen, packed his bags and left but the last thing he saw was a note that showed up on his screen with his address saying you're next. He tried to get his parents to leave with him but obviously they just didn't believe him. He ran away from home knowing his parents were about to die and hasn't gone back since. Filling our number 3 slot are the calls. This one's from redditor Leigh Voiles whose fiance David died in a car accident 6 months prior to making the post. He had gone to his store 45 minutes away to get her ice cream, an hour passed and he hadn't come back. Around 10pm she got a call from his mother saying he had gotten into an accident and died on impact. She carried the guilt with her after he died always thinking you know if I hadn't asked for the ice cream David would have still been alive. While he used to be at work they used to talk over Facebook messenger and so she used to reread their conversations a lot just out of nostalgia and missing him. But his Facebook started saying he was active even though he couldn't have been. She saw it again and again and again. She messaged the account assuming it was a hacker telling them to stop messing with a dead person's account. She started getting sporadic messages back and forth saying hello can you see this it's me it's David please believe me to which she was getting very angry and very hurt because why would someone want to mess with her like that. And just mind you the messages were broken they weren't full words but it was still clear to see what he was saying so I'm just relaying the full message to you guys. But then worst of all he said please peaches which is what he used to call her. She was taken aback but then realised the hacker could have easily gone through their conversations and known that he called her that. Then the account started calling her. She answered and actually heard David say Ashley it's me. She began crying and asked how he was calling and the line cut. Later that night after she got another call he was saying he missed her and this time there was no static whatsoever. She was telling him how she missed him and then all of a sudden he said Ashley why did you kill me? Ashley you killed me you murdering but his voice was deeper, it was distorted. He continued saying, Ashley, you killed me. Then she started getting angry and she pulled herself together knowing David would never talk to her like that. She asked who the hell was speaking and the voice began to laugh maniacally. The deep voice went on saying he wasn't David but he had gotten to know him pretty well over the last few months. He went on saying, who I am doesn't matter. I will tell you what I want. I want your soul. And then the call ended. Before she could even process what just happened, she got a Facebook notification notification saying David is nearby. When I was reading the story for the first time it literally gave me chills and relaying it to you guys right now also gives me chills. Now at number 2 is Hawk. This one's from Shannara Johnson who used to be a tower reader in Sedona, Arizona. She worked at a new age center and there were about 15 to 20 other psychic readers at the center. She was the new girl and her room was across Cindy, a longtime reader. Cindy was middle aged, not particularly friendly and quite witchy. Downstairs was a binder with a picture and bio of all the readers that customers could go through and choose. There was one Native American reader also fairly new called Hawk who everyone loved because he was so nice and he was also married to another reader at the center called Amy. Hawk started warning Shannara about Cindy saying she had no good intentions towards her and that she was jealous of her getting so many customers despite being so new. He went on to say Cindy was an actual witch and was connected to a satanic set of Tibetan monks. One day he told Shannara he had seen Cindy stare at her headshot in the binder and perform a spell over it, weird hand gestures and all. He told Chinara she had to protect herself from Cindy and sage her room more often. At one point he even offered to deal with her and said he could do something about her. Once when the center was quite slow she went to Hawk for a Native American spirit animal reading. During the reading his face suddenly shifted and his features were superimposed by another glowing face. The face had a different voice inside talking about a commitment and a deal and that if she does it she could have whatever 
whatever she wanted. And that line, she recognized it straight away. She knew that was the devil's line. She asked him what commitment he was talking about, and his face disappeared. Shannara made an excuse and left Hawk straight away and got more and more scared of being harmed. She saw divine guidance about Cindy and realized perhaps it was Hawk that was the bad guy all along, enticing her to let him harm her on her behalf. She ended up speaking to Cindy and sorting things out with her, but was damn sure Hawk was Satan himself. His wife Amy even woke up one night and his side of the bed was empty and all she found was a black hellhound with glowing red eyes at the foot of their bed. And finally, at number one is The Asylum. I honestly feel like this one could be the basis of a horror film, and if it gets made into one, I'm gonna be really pissed because I thought of it first. But anyway, this story is from Reddit and Mystic Dragon 19, who is an urban explorer. Well, she was until she decided to explore the Celestial Valley Mental Asylum. Why? Why, people? Why? Abandoned buildings are bad enough. Why would you put yourself through going to a mental asylum? Like, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. But anyway, March 29th, 2019, she packed her bag and necessities, you know, flashlight, phone, some food, etc. I mean, let's be real, this ain't no amateur hour. She got to the asylum at around 7.30 p.m. and what used to be a pristine four-story white building was now a crumbling, rusty one covered in ivy. When she finally got into the building, she first noticed the smell. It didn't smell musky like most old buildings did, it smelled sickly sweet, kind of like death. She then saw a bunch of graffiti everywhere, some band logos, and a a large cruel symbol that to her evoked anger and malice. She saw a gunny against the wall, papers on the ground, real horror movie vibes, but she carried on anyway. She was about to go into the next room when she heard a loud slam. She whipped around and saw the gurney was on its side. It had fallen down despite it not being windy at all, and to make herself feel better, she put some music on to distract herself. By 9.45 pm, she made her way to the second floor, which looked weirdly clean for a decrepit building that showed no signs of life. She she took another step forward and all of a sudden the hall was filled with people, many restrained to gurneys, while doctors took them from room to room. Many of the patients were screaming like animals and as quickly as they came, they disappeared. The user called out when she saw them but they couldn't hear her. She ran downstairs having had enough of the second floor and now past midnight she started hearing Leslie in a sing song distorted voice. Leslie was her name, just to clarify, and she looked everywhere but no one was there. She went towards a room she saw light coming out of but stepped into a puddle of sorts. She put her hand in to feel it, hoping it was water, but of course it was blood. Inside the room, she saw six hooded figures in a circle speaking a language she couldn't understand. She saw a pentagram and a tie down girl laying in the middle of it. At this point, Leslie had had enough, took you long enough, and she ran. She saw a black shapeless figure chasing her. She heard footsteps or hooves from it, and then it let out an unnatural bellow. She managed to get to her apartment at 3.30 in total belief she had just encountered the devil and his minions. <laughs>